All right, apprenticing with Jesus, meaning that, that we're, we're getting to know him and getting to be more like him. If you want to think about it this way, we're covering topics throughout the summer that will help us do the following, to think like Jesus. If we're going to, if we're going to follow him, we need to think like him. And how did Jesus think? How was his thinking informed? We also need to act like him. And then finally, we need to be like him. Now, we're not covering the topics in, in that specific order, but I think that's a good way to think about it. How do I think like Jesus? In other words, how are my opinions of God formed? How, uh, what is my, quote, theology? What, do I, what comes into your mind when you think about God is probably the most important thing about you. And unfortunately, in our day, we, we, we come to the subject of God with a lot of thoughts, with a lot of information that comes at us from various sources, not necessarily all that reliable. And so if we're going to think correctly about the God who loves us and has redeemed us, we need to have our thinking informed by his revelation of himself, which is where? In Scripture. Experience is great. We all need to have experience with God. No one can experience God for you, by the way. Have you ever realized that frustrating thing about you know, people you love, you cannot experience God for anyone other than yourself. That's why we pray for one another, that, God, that, that we would have an encounter with God which is unmistakable. But the information about him is in his word, and that's, that's where we need to form our opinion. A lot of opinions about Jesus out there, but what did Jesus say? Who did Jesus say he was? It's important for us to know that, otherwise we're going to be worshiping something that is not necessarily God or at least how he has revealed himself. The passage this morning is in John chapter 20, and we're not going to go into detail on it because we have a big subject to tackle for about 15 minutes. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at a, the subject of love because... That is the primary thing Jesus told us to do. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So that's, and when we love, we are being like Jesus. We are being like God. Last week, Charles gave us a message on the family business. Jesus said, okay, you're in my family. Now here's what I want you to do. There's a business that we are all attached to, the business of making disciples, the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them, teach them to obey. That's an interesting thing, right? It's not just teach them so our heads get filled with knowledge. Teach them how to do it. Teach them how to obey me. And then he says, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Okay, question for all of us. Define God for me, would you please, class? Give me a definition of God. Beyond definition. Love. Creator of the world. The being of whom no greater being can be conceived. Self-existent one. Father. Almighty. All right, these are different descriptions of God, right? <laughs> and as part of his character, <clears throat> let, me, let me share with you Dallas Willard's description. I think it's pretty good. God is the happiest, most joyful being in the universe. God is not mean. In other words, he's not, he doesn't treat people badly, but he is dangerous. Obviously, God is a lot more. He is omnipotent. All the omnis, right? Omnipotent means what? All-powerful. He is omniscient. What's that mean? All what? All-knowing. All-knowing. He is omnipresent. What's that mean? Everywhere with his total being at the same time. Try that one. And eternal. What's that? Forever. 
No beginning, no end. He always has been. That's why when God revealed himself to Moses, the burning bush, and, and Moses said, who, who am I going to say sent me? God said to him, I am. I am. The name Yahweh, Jehovah, that's what I am. We say it, he has been, he is, he will always be. Those are some things about God. Those are, those are some descriptions, some definitions. Today we're going to engage in systematic theology. What's that? Michael, I've lost you already, man. What is it? <laughs> systematic theology, what is it? Systematic theology is basically an attempt, and it is an attempt, to take a given subject, in this case, the subject that we're going to look at in some detail is Trinity, and we're not going to get done today. This will leak over into next week. The Trinity. And we're going to look at, or try to look at, everything the Bible teaches us about the nature of God as He exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Does that one ever trip you up a little bit? Have you ever tried to explain Trinity to someone? Have you ever cursed ancient Christianity for coming up with this in the first place? Why in the world? Why in the world would we hold on to a doctrine? A doctrine is simply something that we believe, that, that the Scripture teaches. Why would we hang on to a doctrine about God that you can't explain to anyone? Hmm? That, in and of itself, should tell us that somebody, some man, some human, did not make this up. No one would have possibly made this up. So why do we believe it? We believe it because when we do systematic theology, that is the evidence that comes to us from Scripture. Therefore, we believe it. So we're going to engage in a little bit of that today. Now, when we talked about God, we talked about you know, a lot of, lot of things were thrown out there. These are attributes of God. What is an attribute of God? Something that is true about him, right? Simply that, something that's true about him. God has a lot of attributes, and we don't have time, so go read a good book on God. I would recommend J.I. Packer's Knowing God, which is a pretty good one. All right? Attributes of God. Something that is true about him. Some attributes God has all by himself. We don't share them. Some attributes he's actually shared with us, like the ability to love is one. When, when the Bible says God is love, by the way, that's one of the pointers of the Trinity because you can't, love can't exist when there's only one guy around or one girl around, right? There, there needs to be more than one. That's why God exists in Trinity. That's why we can say that God is love. So there's a lot of attributes, things that are true about him, that we mentioned some, omnipresent, omnipotent. He's all wisdom. He has moral attributes. He has divine attributes. He has all of this stuff going on. But today we got to focus for just a few minutes on Trinity. Here's, here's how, the, how it's stated, okay? You ready? This is on your notes. By the way, I hope you've logged on to www.rockridgechurch.org and you have the notes there. So use your cell phones. You have my permission. Use your cell phones. If you're texting, make sure it's Jesus you are texting. <laughs> and if he answers you, let me know. That would be pretty cool. Okay? All right. Doctrine of the Trinity. Here's how it's stated. God eternally, and what does eternal mean again? No ending, no beginning. Eternally exists in a unity as Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God, and yet there is one God. Did you get it? Yeah, you don't have it. I don't have it, all right? This is, this is a doctrine that blows our mind. This is something about God that in the end, no matter how hard we try, we're going to come up a little bit empty and a little bit unsatisfied, frankly, to, 
to truly get our arms right. Now, if that's been the case with you related regarding this doctrine, don't worry about it because if we could fully explain God in every detail about him, he would not, he would not be somebody who is way beyond us and therefore able to truly help us where we have our greatest need. You can't put God in your own box. Even doing systematic theology related to this, we still have some things here that are paradoxes. How can you be both one and three at the same time? And frankly, all of our human existence falls a little short. So let's look at why we hold this doctrine, okay? First of all, the doctrine of the Trinity is progressively revealed in Scripture. In other words, those who are living in the Old Testament times, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, all of the Old Testament people that had their lives well together, right? <laughs> all of these guys and, and, and women, men and women, did not have the full knowledge of the Trinity that we have today, but they had hints of it. And here's a few. First of all, the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, that we find in the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God, is the word Elohim. Anytime, don't you Hebrew scholars, what is any word that ends in im in Hebrew, what's that mean? It's plural. So the word for God, the name, the, the, the name God, as it comes down to us from Hebrew, from the Old Testament, is a plural word. El, so some of the names for God like El Shaddai, all-powerful. El is God, singular. Elohim is plural. So the name itself is a hint that there's more going on. And then in Gen again, Genesis 1.26, God is making, he's creating and all of a sudden, he starts talking to himself. Let us make man in our image. And it goes on. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we even have a hint at Trinity of our own existence. And that is that mankind, the unity, mankind, is plural, male and female. There's genders. And so as God talks to himself, and by the way, part of our reflection, this is important, especially important about marriage. This is why I hold to marriage being of two genders. Because it's part of our identity as human beings. And it's part of, it's part of reflecting the image of God, male and female. And when man and woman come together, one of the purposes for marriage that most of us don't even think about when we get married is that as, as the genders, male and female, come together, there's a unity. That's part of the reflection of the image of God. Do you have that? To deny that is to hold God in contempt. So there's, there's clues right in the first chapter of Scripture. And then there's, there's another one, Psalm 110.1. And, and, this get, and this is quoted throughout the New Testament where David is saying, the Lord says to my Lord. So you have this Lord saying to another guy called Lord. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make my, your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus quotes this about himself. In other words, he's one of the lords. So you have the Lord, Yahweh, God, speaking to the other Lord, Jesus. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a at your feet. And, that, and so Jesus is claiming in that verse, saying that, that's who I am. That's me. So it's progressively revealed in the Old Testament. There's more complete revelation of it in the New Testament. And these are some of the passages, as far as we're going to get today, guys, because we have communion to do. All right? So there's more complete revelation in the New Testament. The baptism of Jesus, what happens? Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Jesus goes to the Jordan River. He tells John, I want you to baptize me. John says, no, I shouldn't baptize you. You know, you ought to be baptizing me. And Jesus says, no, I want you to baptize me. That's McNeff paraphrase. What happens next? All right, well, first of all, John probably dunks him. Jesus comes up out of the water, and what happens? A dove descends from heaven, and then they hear a voice from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So you have in one place 
the different members of the Trinity, God coming, converging in this location. All three are mentioned. And then you have different formulas. The Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations and do what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Sometimes we have no problem with, with the Father and Jesus being God. We do sometimes have a problem with what, what does that mean for the Holy Spirit. The fact that the Holy Spirit is put in there, and we'll get more into this later, in this formula, co-equal with Father and Son, tells us a great deal about who Jesus thinks he is. And then there's this formula repeated throughout the New Testament, and we have Jesus actually saying things to his disciples about, I'm going to send you another comforter who's just like me, and he's going to make things about me known and all of that. Listen to him. And we have in the book of Acts when Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 4 decide that they're going to lie <laughs> to Peter about some property that they sold, and you know the story. They come in and lie, and Peter says, look, why did you lie to God? And then in the very next phrase, why did you think, or, or why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Then in the very next phrase, do you think you can lie to God? In other words, he says Holy Spirit, and then makes Holy Spirit co-equal with God in the very same context. So it is, it's, it, now, the word Trinity is nowhere in Scripture. It's the way for us, when we do systematic theology, to explain the data that we're getting from God's Word. So we invented the word Trinity because it fits. Three and one. Look on your bulletins. Well, in the front. In your bulletin, if you don't have them, they're on, they're on, they're on there. I have a diagram. Uh, we have a picture that we can put up there. I'm way... I'm way uh, can you throw that up there? Can you go... Can you, like, skip to the end? Oh. Oh. All right, Kevin, if you can, skip to the end. And we'll pick up with this stuff next week, all right? Okay, you see this. It's called a Trinitarian diagram. All right, now I want you to note some things about it. You ready? Okay. In the middle, okay, the very essence, we have the word God. Okay? The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They all share, think of it this way, they share the essence. It's the best word I can come up with. It's the best word theologians have been able to come up with. They share the essence of deity. They share the essence of God. But they're a unity and they're distinct. So it cannot be said that the Father is the Son. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Son is also not the Spirit, nor is the Spirit the Son or the Father. Do you get that? They are distinct, and yet they are one. So, a couple of things here. Can it be said that the Father died for your sins? No. Father did not die for your sins. The Son died for your sins. Can it be said God died for your sins? Yes, because Jesus is God. He shares the essence of God, of deity. So we have to be very careful. Sometimes when we say God, we're actually meaning the Father. So it can be said that God died for your sins in the sense that Jesus is God, but it cannot be said that the Father and the Spirit died for your sins. They're distinct. And we're going to look at that. So does that blow your mind? All right. That blows your mind. That's why, that's why when it comes to illustrating the Trinity with different, you know, saying a uh, three-leaf clover, things like that, they all fall apart a little bit because usually they get into something called modalism. You know what modalism is? Modalism is how most of us, unfortunately, think about the Trinity. So we think there's one God, and sometimes He appears as the Father, sometimes He appears as the Son, sometimes He appears as the Spirit. It is not correct as Scripture describes it. They are distinct. There's not one guy act, you know, putting on different costumes or regalia. They are three distinct, and yet there is one God. Okay? All right, class, that's it for today. Your minds are blown. Now, wh why, why spend time on this? 
Is it really that important? It is important for so many reasons that we'll look at next week, but there's one really crucial reason why it's important that God is Trinity, and that is the very thing that we're going to go to right now, which is communion. We celebrate communion because of what Jesus did for us. What did Jesus do for us? Charles will explain a little more later, but what does he do for us? He died for our sins. To put it simply, okay, a kid can understand that, right? We can all understand that. Can I die for your sins? Why not? I mean, I'm a pretty nice guy, pretty good guy. Why can't I die for your sins? I got my own sins, yeah, that's for sure. I can't even die for my own sins. Why not? Because I don't have the capacity. I am not God. I can, I can, it's that little word life we've used a lot. I have a certain type of life, and so do you as a human being, called suke life, spirit soul life. I do not possess on my own Zoe life which is eternal life that God possesses, only God can give out. And if I don't have it from God through His Son, Jesus, I don't have it. If Jesus was not God, He is not eternal, therefore He could only die for your, you and my physical life, our suke life. He could not die and give to us Zoe life that God has. He just couldn't. It would be beyond His capacity. It is important that Jesus is both God and man. As man, he took our place. As God, what he did, he was able to do. <laughs> he was empowered to do. Charles is going to come and lead us in communion.